So today I'm really happy to share with you uh, the story about Kevin Niles. And um, I hope that you will enjoy this presentation. So let the journey begin. Okay. Oh. Okay. Try now. Okay. Uh, parents, Tom and Willoughby Nellis. Tom arrived in Houston uh, many years ago, so seven years before our marriage, and he was busy in processing various issues and. and he had acquired some capital resources, and then he was looking for a place to settle. He came to Kansas City, and, he, and uh, he wasn't too impressed on his first trip to the mall. He didn't think it was going to be the place he wanted to settle down. I don't know if it was the time of the year he came, and anyway, he came to Kansas City for the second visit, and he was really impressed with the ladies and the Greeks and the a bunch of ads with uh, a dog or a fuzzy cat on his horse, and then he thought of his wife, which all ran, and that uh, was lots of wild life and food before. So he purchased a summer party. Now, um, and then he decided to go out to Ireland to marry his child's sweetheart, uh, Lenina Wade. And so they were married to the side of the government. Um, in 1872, and they traveled and arrived in Westminster, and in uh, seven days or five, the pledge arrived from the Westminster Church to Manhattan. Now, it's still been a long way, probably, to visit some of the South families in Hope and Princeton and Caribbean, because there were some families there at that time. Now, when they arrived, there was no room on this two room cottage. There was no room at all. So I don't think he had to prepare to find the fact that they were pretty rustic with no room. There were, of course, no legends here in the economy or any of that sort of thing. I'm not going to choose you as well. I think you're here. Now, what was the This is a picture of why I was on the deck of the ground in 1870. It was a sound and it was a to a small street, but they is west. Um, and um, it was located in what now would be near Windsor Street and Fairview Road. Um, I was just using the roof of the bed, unfortunately. And you can see that on the side of the building, such as tables, stores, shows, and trading posts, etc. Um, and until 1887, when the family was born, uh, all the supplies were around were packed over from the Hulk um, along the duty uh, trail by a factory train of about 20 to 30 horses. And, and this factory train was being about uh, twice a year. It was not a way to supplies to them. This um, shows you a uh, map of. Oh, so we can that up. And then you can see the Ellis homestead located right here. And here is a study of the first and church area. Uh, and then you can see some of the other areas. Now, now there was, he actually diverted a stream uh, to provide water for the uh, branch and that. Uh, Stratford Creek, which is close to the river, so some people are drinking water to the water. This shows you a photograph of the Ellis children. Now, there are nine of them. Um, and uh, they arrived about every two years, it was a big. Um, there were the seven daughters and two sons. And in this picture, uh, Kathy is his baby. The, uh, her sister, and her sister, hang on my head to Now, Kathy says at this age, and he goes, I was just the word in the melody, uh, just to get back, because this was the word that she used in the record, and I also used the word in the kitchen, and that's kind of a little back and forth, and you can't keep up with them. Kathy says at this age, she means we're friends, uh, because the closest to her family is like three miles away. And then Lily and Rock, she did to see any of her family for months and months, and she was quite isolated. 
Um, um, said it's a girl for death death category. This is you uh, this is a record that was about casting and then tell us exactly where their child was born. Now, three of the children were born in Antigua, Thomas, Silent, and Kathleen, and Thomas. Um, your father, apparently, uh, officiated as a doctor, tourist, and in life, with the help of the Indian woman. Um, first doctor, Dr. Blake, didn't arrive in Antigua until 1902, so there was no hospital doctors, etc. It was in the museum that the eldest children also survived childhood uh, during the time when, you know, children were to child and all sorts of things, all sorts of things. It was perhaps because they were isolated in this community. They didn't have a lot of contact with other children. And probably the very healthy lifestyle. I mean, there were doors a lot riding around all over the place. Um, the only sad thing was that Thomas died at age uh, 24 when he was killed by a bucking horse, which is kind of sad. Now, this is, uh, I assume that the children who were born in U.S. Minster were born at the Royal Columbian Hospital. And this would be what it would have looked like about the time that the children were being there. There was no other hospital at that time. And the Royal Columbian Hospital is the oldest hospital in British Columbia, actually. So I assume that the children were probably born there, but I'm not absolutely sure about that, but that's an assumption. Now, was an exciting trip sometimes for the children. When a new baby was expected, the family would travel to Westminster to celebrate the arrival of the new family member. And the children viewed this as a really good experience to go over horseback and travel down to Westminster, looking forward to the safe arrival of a baby. Um, so that was, and that just shows you the uh, duty trail. Um, this is actually um, Kathleen's birth certificate. And it's really interesting um, because it was written actually, um, completed in 1935 by her sister, Caroline, who was living in England. So I don't know if her birth was not registered at an earlier time or not. And also it's interesting that her um, father's occupation was listed as cattle ranching. And the person present as her birth says, no doctor, an Indian woman only who was present at her birth. So she was a whole birth. This is kind of interesting. This is just a picture of the ranch in uh, 1892 when Kathleen was um, about five years old. It was interesting that all the ranch hands were Indians from the Penticton Reserve, and Tom only hired Indigenous people. There were no other people to hire um, to work actually on his ranch. Um, by this time, the house was enlarged, and you can see there's a white picket fence that has been added. The grounds was a gathering place actually for those traveling to the valley, which provided shelter and much needed supplies. It was a very busy place. You can imagine can you, this place, which wasn't that large, with nine children, a <laughs> uh, very busy household, a father that was galloping all over the, looking after this cow, and there was Wilhelmina there in this house with raising nine children. Um, so actually, Kathleen was, I uh, guess, really influenced by this. And I felt all along in the story that her early childhood had a great influence on her further career because of the things that she experienced as a child growing up in this environment. It was quite a happy place from what I can understand. Um, and that uh, the children had access to many books, uh, etc. And in the evenings, sometimes they play party games and this type of thing. So whatever she wrote about it, it sounded like a happy time. Um, Tom was known to have a reputation for wanting a full day's work from his employees and was no place for idleness, in his view. 
And I think this work ethic did influence Kathleen in her later career. because She's also extremely hardworking. And I think she grew up with this Protestant sort of work ethic. This is just to show you, um, there, it was reported that according to records that Tom did plant the first fruit trees in Pentax. And then this is just a picture of a cherry tree that the father had planted um, close to his property. Now this next few slides are really interesting. This is a treasure and I have to thank um, Jean and the archives for letting me know that this little notebook did exist. It was written by Kathleen when she was six years of age. And as close as you could see, this, this book uh, belongs to Kathleen and Wilhelmina. She's named after her mother, and it was written you know, when she was six. Um, and I'll just show you some of the things that were included in it. This is her house. It's kind of a cute little bit. She wasn't a great artist, but you can see it's a house. You can see that there are flowers. Sorry. I don't it changed the slide. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it. Okay. Uh, thank you. You can see that there are flowers and there's a little animal there. They have a lot of pets actually. They have, uh, you know, cats and dogs and cows and lambs and goats and birds. Uh, and they all also have bear cub. Which, do you want to hear the sad tale of the bear or not? Yes or no? Yes, 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 no. Oh, I'm kidding. Well, it's not sad. Sandy says no, so but those are yours. Anyway, they had a bear cub and it grew, of course, and got away their aggressive and was pawing at them. So according to Kathleen, they killed it and ate it. So it's just not a very nice story. It's kind of like just squeamish. But this was a farm, remember? And people killed animals and they did eat them. That was part of the living. Um, okay, that was a story about her, uh, her experience. And then this next one is about her homeschooling. Uh, or she states that um, she doesn't go to school because there isn't one, which is true. And she's taught by tutors and by her mother, Rolina, and sometimes, uh, you know, also her uncle Wade, apparently. I should mention that um, Rolina's brother did join uh, and moved to Penticton. You're familiar with the Wade name anyway, probably. Um, so Kathleen out here, Brothers and sisters were homeschooled because there was no school. They were taught by governesses um, and the uh, uh, minister or rector of the Anglican Church and her mother and her uncle Wade. As I said earlier, she had access to many books because there were many books in the home. She was an avid reader as a child. However, both uh, Tom and Will needed believe that the girls should be educated as ladies. And therefore, her sisters were sent to boarding schools in England, what would be like a finishing school, I guess, in other words, to be educated. Uh, they stayed there for a few years. Um, I don't know about the boys, the brothers. There was no record that said that the boys were sent anywhere to school. So I assume they were homeschooled and maybe then they worked with Tom looking after his property. That's just an assumption, I'm afraid. Uh, when Kathleen uh, reached the age when she was supposed to go to boarding school, um, she didn't want to go, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So they were, as I said, they were homeschooled for a long time. This just shows you uh, another uh, one about a sick pigeon. Um, this is one that her uncle gave her and it got sick and she made it better and it flew away. So she was very happy about uh, nursing this pigeon, which maybe gives us a little bit about her later career. This one I found interesting because it's what she writes about. This is a picture, I think, of a nurse with the nursing cap. It's kind of a cute picture. Um, as I said, there were no hospitals, no nurses, no doctors. Um, Kathleen's mother had a medicine chest and she had a medical book 
that was a reference for her and she used that when she needed to solve some medical problems. Um, it was said that she was skilled in practical nursing and always ready to assist anyone, be they Indian or white. When Tom broke his leg, uh, Wilhelmina looked at her book and she fixed his leg and it set and it was fine. So that was the story according to Kathy. Um, of course, the indigenous people would have shared their knowledge with her and she would have shared her knowledge with them. A lot of reciprocity was going on amongst the women in caring for their, their people. Um, the children were taught um, by the indigenous children about living in the wild. And one thing that they were taught was how to kill rattlesnakes. Manita knows how I love snakes. So anyway, uh, Kathleen said that the snakes loved the sound at the beach. And when they went for a picnic at the beach, it was not complete without them killing uh, five or six rattlesnakes. So anyway, that's a little bit of trivia there. So. This is just um, a little picture of the Alice house in uh, winter, just what it looked like with the old buildings and the picket fence. Uh, there wasn't any date for this one, but I just thought it was really interesting to show you that. Now, Kathleen refused to go to boarding school in England. She put her foot down and said, I'm not going. I live in Canada. I'm going to stay in Canada. I'm going to be educated in Canada. And she won that battle, which is shows her her character actually, she's very determined. So she was enrolled at the um, Havagal College in Toronto where she remained from the age of 13 to 17. Um, Wilhelmina had provided her with a, what was thought to be an appropriate wardrobe for her. When she got there, uh, the powers that be said, no, it wasn't suitable. She had to get new clothes. And Kathleen said, if it's good enough for Penticton, it's good enough for Toronto. However, she lost that battle, <laughs> so um, she had to have a new set of clothes provided, and her mother intervened and did that. She graduated in uh, 1904 with a high school diploma. Now, around this time when she was graduating, um, Tom Ellis had decided that he was going to um, sell his property. He had uh, a long career. I think he was having some health problems as well and decided it was time to sell this vast enterprise. And so when Kathleen moved back to Penticton after she graduated, uh, the family moved to Victoria in a large home on the Corridge. Uh, she was 18. The estimated value of this estate at that time was in excess of $400,000, which today would be like between 12 and 13 million, you know, about that amount of money perhaps. Um, Kathleen moved to Victoria with the family and she remained there for a few years, but she was not happy at all living there. She was much too interested in what was going on in the world. She didn't like the tea parties, you know, the French lessons, the golf lessons, and I'm sure that some suitors were created in front of her. She never married, but she was at a eligible age, and I'm sure her parents were trying to see if she could find someone to marry, but she didn't. Uh, she was just tired of this life, and she said she was just bored out of her mind. And she said, I'm going to be a nurse. Remember the picture of that when she was a child and her mother's experience with nursing? Well, this didn't go down well with Bill Bean or, or Tom at all. They didn't think this was a suitable vocation for this educated woman. It was not suitable at all. Nursing didn't have a high profile at that time. Again, she prevailed and she put her foot down and said, I'm going, and they did allow her to go. So what she did, and she enrolled in a very prestigious school of nursing, which was the John Hopkins Hospital School of Nursing in Baltimore, where she did for three years, and she graduated at the age of 28. Um, why did she choose this particular school of nursing? I was really well-known in North America. He was probably one of the oldest, most prestigious schools of nursing on the continent. There were schools of nursing in Victoria, Vancouver, Winnipeg, and Toronto. But she, I think, set her sights beyond the, and she wanted to go. And that was probably a pattern throughout her life in the selection of places that she went to work 
and where she went to be educated. She chose really very prestigious places. Um, and this just so it would have provided her with very good educational opportunities. And maybe when she was in Toronto in high school, she knew something about this school of nursing. I really don't know that part of it. This just shows you um, a picture of a very typical patient ward. This is the John Hopkins Hospital with a ward. It's very staged for the photograph, of course. Um, and you can see. Am I doing something? No, it's fine. Uh, so you can see that these are nursing students because of the color of their uniform. It's not pure white. It would probably be gray or, or blue. They have, um, well, of course, you can tell this is a very time period because of the length of the uniform touching the ground. Uh, they had cuffs, well, starch cuffs up to their elbows. Um, this would, they would have to remove those in order to provide care. They have to take off the cuffs and have to roll up their sleeves, of course. So it's a bit staged. It was quite typical of these wards to have 10 patients on either side of the ward. And this was very typical of the patient wards that were at the time. Um, I experienced that when I was first as a nursing student. <clears throat> there were patients that were in wards like that at each age. And I remember talking to one of the men, and he, they have now started having more single and double rooms. But he said that he felt very safe on I mean, that big open ward because there was always somebody there. And if he needed help, he could call for it. He's never felt alone. He gave up pride. He thought privacy was not as important as the safety. It was an interesting perspective because we don't have those wards anymore. Then this was, a, of course, during World War One, and uh, Kathleen returned to Victoria, where she became matron of the Vancouver Island Military Hospital, which was in a Sklano outside of Victoria. Um, this just shows you, it's not a great picture, but you can see the nursing staff. It was a convalescent hospital, actually, for veterans returning from the um, First World War, and there was a separate building for patients with tuberculosis. The Esquimalt Hospital had been there since 1894 and provided care for sailors going up and down the coast. The Canadian Naval Service was established in 1910, and the government, federal government, took over the running of the hospital. And so they sort of renovated a bit uh, for veterans returning uh, from uh, World War I. Now, Tom died in 1918, just about the time when she completed her time there at uh, this hospital. And she, uh, as part of his estate, Kathleen received $40,000 from his estate, which of course converted to today's money would be probably in excess of $1 million. This provided her with funds, which allowed her to pursue some of her other interests because she became independently you know, well, they can afford things, which I think influenced some of her future endeavors. Following this, she actually can supervise the operating rooms in the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. I don't have much information on that, other than it was uh, used for people with, uh, you know, drug addiction, etc. cetera, and given treatment. It was an interesting place for her to go. I don't know why she chose Detroit, but she was there just for one year. And then she moved on. I think she was trying to find her place in the nursing profession. And then in 1921, she became the second assistant at the Toronto General Hospital School of Nursing. Toronto General probably had the largest school of nursing in the province. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I gotta go back. Oh, no, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I did something. No, I finished it for you. Thank you. Um, and where she was second assistant at Toronto General Hospital. And I think that there was a real communication going on. There weren't a lot of nursing leaders or superintendents and nursing in Canada, and they talked to one another a lot. There was a real network going on between all of them. And I think she probably found out that the UBC had opened in 1918 the first degree program in the British Empire. 
And I think Kathleen that germinated a bit of an idea for them on higher education for nurses. Um, degrees, this is really interesting, you know, promoting the profession at another level. And I think she was really interested in that. And she probably heard about that when she was at Toronto through the nursing network. So what happened was, on the next few years, she, 1921 to 1929, she was superintendent of nurses and principal of the School of Nursing at the Vancouver General Hospital. It had the uh, second largest school of nursing in the country. Now, as I said, UBC had opened their program uh, in 1918. The students uh, had the clinical experience at Vancouver General. And Ethel Johns was the person who actually was the director of the School of Nursing at UBC and also superintendent of nurses at BG. She had this dual position. Um, it became a bit too much, so she decided to resign as superintendent of the hospital, which opened up the position for Kathleen. So Kathleen, I think, saw this as a really interesting career move where she could see firsthand the um, you know, development of the university's uh, program and see how it evolved. And so she did, um, worked very closely with Ethel Johns for the next few years while well, we very successfully launched this new degree program in nursing. And I think that sparked her interest because we'll talk a little bit later on about what she did in Saskatchewan. This just shows you uh, the graduation class with Kathleen Kathleen in the center in 1926. As I said, BGH had the second largest number of students in Canada and there are 60 graduates in this particular photograph. Years later, Lady Jade had actually 500 students enrolled in their nursing program in the 1950s, graduated many, many nurses. Uh, Kathleen also was very involved in nursing professional associations. And while she was in Vancouver, she was president of the Graduate Nurses Association and actually president of the Graduate Nursing Association of BC, which later on became the Registered Nurses Association. Throughout her career, she was a very... Okay. <laughs> I help her. Well, she knows how to help her. <laughs> Um, throughout her career, she was an active participant in provincial and federal nursing associations, and this networking kept her very much up to date provincially and federally. In 1929, Kathleen decided to pursue public health nursing. Now, I don't quite know why she decided to do this, but she enrolled at Bedford College, College of Nursing in London, England. Uh, I think that it was because at BGH, uh, the School of Nursing at UBC, had a very strong emphasis on public health nursing in their program. In fact, they had a diploma program that prepared public health nurses for the newly opened public health units that were across Canada, across British Columbia. So I think she wanted to know more about public health nursing, so she enrolled in this one. Why did she go to England? Perhaps because of their long history of having public health, and she felt she could learn from that experience. But she wanted to go on her views. While there, she visited various um, other countries, such as Austria, Germany, Belgium, and Czechoslovakia. She could do that because she was independently wealthy and could afford these visits. After this, she didn't pursue public health nursing, but she took a job as director of nursing at the Winnipeg General Hospital, uh, Rishini, from 1930 to 1935, and was vice president of the Canadian Nurses Association. Uh, again, Winnipeg had a very uh, was a large hospital and had a very good school of nursing as well. Now, I think in her mind, she must have heard by the grapevine that in Saskatchewan, there was a movement of the university to open a university school of nursing. And I thought, she thought, mm, that's interesting because I could be in the groundwork and get involved in the opening of this very good program. But she lacked some academic credentials. She had a diploma in nursing, but she didn't have any academic uh, degrees. So she enrolled in um, 
at uh, the Teachers College at Columbia University, again, a very prestigious university, well known across the world. And she obtained her Bachelor of Science degree and she graduated in 1937. Then uh, what she began was then her career in Saskatchewan, which lasted for the next 13 years. She uh, held a position as registrar of the Saskatchewan um, Registered Nurse Association, as well as an advisor to the schools of nursing. And she was also appointed to at the, by the University of Saskatchewan, which is in Saskatoon, and was very instrumental in the opening of their degree program in nursing at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, then at her next job, this is just a picture of the University of Saskatchewan, what it may have looked like. She was there in Saskatoon. Sorry, and then in 1939, the Rockefeller Foundation sent her to tour hospitals in Europe. Now, this was at the, just before the beginning of the Second World War. She was there in the early part of 19. Where she visited the tour hospitals in uh, Prague, Dresden, Berlin, or mainly in Germany, as well as Vienna, Athens, and others. I don't know what the purpose of this visit was and what she, information she collected, whether it was task finding, what I don't really know. I didn't pursue that any further, but it might be interesting to know a little bit more about that. Anyways, she did that as well. And then during World War II, she probably had a job that was the most important one of her career, where she was appointed by the Canadian Nurses Association to conduct a national nursing survey. During the Second World War, there was a huge shortage of nurses because nurses had signed up to serve overseas in the military. Uh, and they were leaving the workforce and was depleting them. Plus, women, when they got married, tended to not continue working. It was kind of the thing that you didn't work when you got married. Teachers had to leave the profession when you got married. It was kind of the thing. It didn't happen that women went into the workforce until after the Second World War, really, when it was acceptable. So she was to go and try to recruit nurses. We need nurses. Go out there and see if you can encourage nurses to return to the profession if you've already left it. Um, she visited all the provinces across Canada, all the schools of nursing, the hospitals. She gave many presentations and presented at conferences. And she said, well, if you want to get nurses into the profession, you have to improve the working conditions. They have to improve you know, their wages because nurses made a pivot. I mean, they couldn't even hardly afford to live on their own. They lived in residences attached to hospitals. They lived in hospital rooms. They, and matrons lived in the hospitals. Actually, Penticton Lear House was at one point uh, a nurse's home for the nurses that were in the Penticton Hospital. So in order to promote this, she had to improve their working conditions. And she said, governments got to involve nurses in these decisions. Nurses know what's best for them and need to engage them in making these decisions about the nursing profession. Um, so she just tell that the welfare of patients and the welfare of nurses are intertwined, you can't separate them. So she completed her report, many of her recommendations were implemented. And I think uh, that was a momentous uh, work that she did, and she was well known for that right across the country. In 1943, this was the first graduation class of the University of Saskatchewan and School of Nursing, and you can see her seated in the center of all that group. Later on, the University of Saskatchewan had a really interesting camp. It was like a mortar board, which doesn't show on that one, but I worked with a couple of nurses who graduated there. It was really a little uh, mortar board type camp. It was really quite unique. Who was Kathleen the person? Well, this I found interesting um, that she lived at this hotel when she was in Saskatoon, which was the uh, Vesper Hotel. She was independently wealthy. This enabled her to live at the hotel, and she entertained her uh, colleagues and friends in the dining room. I thought it was interesting. I found that in the records. Also, this girl, Kathleen, as a professional, who is she as a person? She's described as dignified, or gracious, independently wealthy, known for her exotic hats, because she had a real collection of beautiful hats. 
and she was immaculately dressed. She was described as diminutive, uh, had more get up and go than many women her size. She was slim and she was chic. Those are some words she described. Now, in 1950, Catherine had had it. She was ready to retire. So, where was she going to retire to? She liked New York. She lived there when she was at teacher's college, and it really drew her back. She thought she might live there. She traveled across Europe and North America, but she decided to come to Kentucky, where she wanted to retire to her birthplace. And so she arrived here um, and she purchased uh, a house on 268 County Street. And this is the picture of the house as it exists today. Uh, she had a lovely garden with roses. She had fruit trees. People were welcome to any of her fruit as long as they came and picked it and could help themselves to whatever they wanted. She was really delighted that some of her neighbors loved to play bridge, and she liked that as well. Um, she, um, she became intrigued, it says, each day with the intricacies of housekeeping. Because she had not had done this since she was a child, because she was being away from hotel. Uh, not one to be idle. She served on the hospital board for quite a while and presented things on my whole care nursing. And she would act throughout her whole life as a consultant to the Registered Nurses Association of British Columbia. And she had maintained this membership throughout her professional career. In 1956, a new nurse's residence at the University of Saskatchewan was named Ellis Hall in her honor. Uh, that was based on the fact that she was the first director of nursing at that school. In 1955, Catherine received an honorary doctorate from the University of Saskatchewan to mark the opening of the University Hospital. And the Kathleen Alice Prize was established and awarded eminently to the most distinguished graduate in nursing. She was described as one of Canada's most distinguished daughters. She is known and respected across Canada for her administrative hospital nursing service and nursing education. No nurse has had greater influence, which was quite the truth. Just to show you a picture of St. Saviour's Church, I mention this because, as you know, uh, Tom and Bill Nina had erected the first church on um, South their property, St. Saviour's, and, uh, and then when the new um, church was erected in 1934, the chancel was relocated to the new building and became part of the building. And it's uh, apparently it is the oldest historical building in Penticton. That was shows your picture. And she was a very uh, loyal, a loyal supporter of St. Saviour's Church based upon her, of course, memories of it as a child. In 1966, the new city hall was opened and Kathleen was made a freeman of the city in a tribute to her pioneer parents, the second woman to receive this. And uh, she also cut the ribbon at the opening and you can see her receiving her award in 1966. In 1966 as well, you can see her in front of a historical marker for the Ellis Homestead. The marker was erected to celebrate the Ellis family. Kathleen was the only original family member actually still alive in 1966. And she was the only one who settled in Penticton. Uh, her siblings, Frank, had moved to Victoria. Others had moved to Westminster, Hamilton, and England. So she was the only one really that came back to Penticton. There was also a special banquet held um, to honor the Ellis family. And uh, it was called the Ellis Centennial Banquet. And she was the a guest of honor and 300 people attended this. And she presented uh, a photograph of her family at that time. In 1967, she received the Canadian Centennial Medal for her valuable service to the nation. Now, Kathleen died in 1968 in Vancouver at 81 after a three week hospitalization in Vancouver. And she was buried at the Law Space Cemetery in Victoria, along with her parents, Tom and Wilhelmina. The other children were not buried there. This just shows you um, the grave site in Law Space Cemetery in Victoria. And this is the plaque. And as there's another picture I'll show you, which is the next one, which is a little bit 
clear picture of the plaque itself. It does list all the names of the eldest children, which apparently was quite customary at the time, even though they were buried there. Their names were listed on the plaque with their birth and death. So that was there. This is just a little bit of trivia, which I thought was kind of interesting, which is her estate sale. And it lists some of the items that were for sale in her estate. You can just have a quick look at that if you like. Some of the items that were for sale that were her household items. The usual things that one would expect, I guess, from an estate sale. I have no idea who was recipient of her estate at all. I didn't look into that at all. I didn't look for a will or anything. So just, I found that in the archives, actually. Now, I'd just like to conclude with some tributes that were made to Kathleen by her nursing colleagues at the time of her death. She was one of the best educated nurses in Canada, very sound judgment boundless energy, which we know she definitely had. She fought for better working conditions for nurses. She had the ability to mobilize others and was called a propagandist. And I think that was based somewhat on her time when she did the survey for the government because she actually um, uh, made, gave 104 presentations across Canada and attended 49 conferences during that two-year period. No wonder she was ready to retire in 1950. Uh, so that, uh, as I said, she, she molded the need for qualified nursing instructors. So she promoted the development of the profession and recommended changes for the education of Canadian nurses, and many of these were implemented. Uh, so that was uh, some of the things that were made in her legacy. And in uh, closing, I would just like to thank the uh, Jean and Gary at the archives for helping me with this presentation, providing some of the photographs and material for this. And I hope that that's provided you with a little bit about the story of Kathleen Ellis, which I, she was an incredible person when you think of all the things that she did accomplish. And she was born here in Penticton, and, and a place that nobody had even heard of before. But she was born in 1887. Nobody even knew where Penticton was. It wasn't even called Penticton, I don't think, at that point. So she developed into this incredible nursing leader and was emulated uh, and still is known across Canada. So thank you.